Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, my name is Laura Karstensen. I'm a professor of psychology and the founding director of the Stanford Center on Longevity, and I'm delighted to see you here this afternoon for our distinguished lecture series. As you know, uh, longevity changes everything. Uh, with more people living longer than ever before in human history, we really need to rethink how we live our lives. Uh, how we work, how we learn, how we save and spend money, how our communities support or fail to support us, um, and how we can build relationships that endure uh, for, for decades and participate in communities that are becoming increasingly diverse by age, by ethnicity, and along many other variables all at the same time. Uh, we are honored and privileged today to have Professor Jamil Zaki here with us as our featured lecturer this afternoon. He's going to talk about his work and about a new book that he has recently published called The War for Kindness, Building Empathy in a Fractured World. Professor Zaki is one of my colleagues in psychology, um, one of my favorite colleagues in psychology, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> here at, at Stanford, and he runs the Stanford Social Neuroscience Laboratory. He trains graduate students in both neuroscience approaches and behavioral approaches, uh, social network analyses of relationships and empathy, and he teaches classes at the undergraduate and graduate level. He received his bachelor's degree in cognitive neuroscience from Boston University and his PhD from Columbia University before he completed a postdoctoral fellowship at, at Harvard and then came to Stanford to join the faculty here. Uh, Professor Zaki publishes extensively in academic journals and he also writes for outlets like the Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, and The New Yorker, The New York Times. Uh, so he's very much a, a, a public intellectual, a thought leader in this area. And he's pioneered uh, a novel, innovative um, approach to the study of empathy and sees it as, as a learnable skill. Uh, his work focuses on training individuals, groups, and organizations uh, to empathize more effectively. So um, we've never needed someone like him more <laughs> than in today's world. Please welcome my colleague, Jamil Zaki. Thank you. Thanks so much for that introduction, Laura. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, I've got maybe 40-ish minutes worth of stuff to say. I like to reserve deeper conversation towards the end so we can all talk together. But if in the meantime you have like burning questions or anything's unclear, please interrupt me at any time. Um, so uh, this is Tony McAleer, uh, pictured about 25 years ago at the height of his influence in Canada's white power movement. Tony grew up in Vancouver in a tumultuous household. His father didn't pay much attention to him because he was paying attention to other people. In fact, when Tony was 10, he walked in on his father in bed with a woman who was not Tony's mother, um, which detonated his family and left Tony feeling isolated and angry. He found solace in music. He loved uh, punk bands like uh, Black Flag and The Clash. And guess what? I love those bands too. But unfortunately for Tony, he fell into a different type of music, bands that expressly promote white power ideology. And at their shows and on their message boards, he found a type of acceptance and community he hadn't felt in a long time. And he was hooked. By the time he was 17, he had pinned a swastika onto his jacket. He spent hours a day on online forums talking about Holocaust denialism. And he started something called Canadian Liberty Net, a phone line that people could call into to hear xenophobic and anti-Semitic voicemails. It was a hit. At its peak, it received hundreds of calls a day, and Tony appeared on national television multiple times as an avatar of the new generation of neo-Nazis. He was lost to the world, made of hatred. He told me that when this picture was taken, Tony was sure he would be dead or in jail within a few years. Now, maybe you've heard Tony's story already, and maybe even if you haven't, parts of it feel familiar to you. Maybe you think that Tony is fundamentally different than all of us, and maybe you're right. Thankfully, most people from broken homes don't become neo-Nazis. But I would argue that if Tony was psychologically sick, then the type of illness he had is not as rare as we might wish it to be. 
I think many of us are noticing that as our culture seems to be pulling apart at the seams, that we as individuals too are feeling less connected, angrier, even more hateful. I think that Tony's descent into hatred, in fact, is emblematic of why it's become harder for us to connect with each other. But I also think that his escape from this life offers clues about how any of us can learn to connect better. Those are the two ideas in the War for Kindness, and those are the two ideas I want to talk about today. Um, to do so, though, we have to go back to the beginning, like way back to the beginning, like 50 or 100,000 years ago, to a time when people really weren't that special. We were just medium-sized mammals, not particularly fast or strong, and we weren't even the only smart species on the planet. At that time, we shared the Earth with at least five other large-brained human species. And yet, sapiens had one thing that set us apart, and that was each other. More than any other animal, we collaborated, worked together, and cared for one another, and that made all the difference. Because even if, as individuals, we were unassuming, as a collective, we were like breathtaking. We could do things no other animal could ever dream of. It's by working together that we took over the world. But what allows us to work so well together? Well, psychologists and neuroscientists recently have zoomed in on one piece of this puzzle, which is the weird and wonderful fact that even though all of us are physically separate, psychologically, we overlap. That feeling of overlapping with other people can be so intense that sometimes when we see someone go through something, it feels like it's actually happening to us. Has anyone had that experience recently? If you haven't, and you're not scared of heights, if you are, you can look away, here's a guy walking across the Grand Canyon. There he goes. Hmm? OK, so if you can see this, some people can. Um, so the funny thing is that, um, that you and me and all of us are sitting or standing on solid, well, relatively solid. This is the Bay Area, but mostly solid ground more solid than this guy, um, in no danger of plummeting to our doom. And yet, if you're anything like me, just looking at this video, you might feel your palms start to sweat. You might feel a bit nervous, like it was you, not him up there on the wire. If you just experienced that, what you went through is a, a primitive form of empathy, our emotional connections to each other. The type of empathy you might have just gone through, catching this other person's anxiety, is not uniquely human. Non-human primates, monkeys, dolphins, elephants, rats, mice, and some birds, at least, show signs that they share each other's pain, for instance. But in humans, empathy took an evolutionary quantum leap. We empathize more broadly than any other animal, not just with people in the room with us. We can empathize with someone who's a thousand miles away. We can empathize with future generations a thousand years from now who don't exist yet, we can empathize with fictional characters who will never exist. Not only is our empathy broad, it's complicated. In fact, human empathy is not really one thing at all. We think of it as an umbrella term for the multiple ways that we respond to each other's emotions. So for instance, let's say that you're having lunch with a friend and he gets a phone call. You don't know who's on the other line or what they're saying, but you can tell it's not good because your friend begins to cry. Well, as you see him breaking down, a bunch of things might happen in you. First, you might feel bad yourself, vicariously sharing his feeling, which we would call emotional empathy. You might also try to figure out or understand what your friend feels and why, which we would call cognitive empathy. And if you're a decent friend, at least, you probably care about what your friend is going through and wish for him to feel better. These three pieces together make up the full range of human empathy. Now, you can think about your own level of empathy, we can also think about like, the collective empathy in this room, or on this campus, or in this country, as the human equivalent of a natural resource. And it is a precious one. At this point, decades of evidence demonstrate the many ways that empathy benefits everyone involved, including the people who feel it. Sometimes we think about caring for other people as something that we only do for other people, but it turns out that empathic versus less empathic people benefit themselves in all sorts of ways as well. They tend to report greater happiness, less stress, and less depression. They have an easier time 
forming and keeping important relationships in their life, they even succeed professionally more, for instance, are more likely to rise to positions of leadership. Empathy's benefits, of course, bubble outward. Patients of empathic physicians are more satisfied with their care, but also more likely to listen to physicians' recommendations. Employees of empathic managers call in sick less often with stress-related illnesses. And I don't know if this is shocking to anybody, um, but spouses of empathic partners are happier in their marriages. Um, but maybe the most important thing that empathy does for us is it allows us to stitch together bigger, broader communities. Empathic individuals are more likely to volunteer and donate to charity. They're less likely to see people who are different from them through the lens of stereotyping, prejudice, or bias. And they're more interested in like, preserving the planet for future generations as well. So this is great. We've got like this ancient social glue that brings us all together, and we, the most empathic animal ever to exist on this planet, run the whole show. We must be living in like this social utopia, just all holding hands and sitting together in a global circle saying, no, wait, <laughs> that's not what life feels like at all, is it? Empathy is hard, and I would argue it's getting harder. And to see why, we can just return to our ancient friends here and think about the social world in which empathy evolved the world that empathy is built for. At that time, say 100,000 years ago, people existed in tiny bands of hunter-gatherers, just a few families apiece. What that meant is that if you ran into somebody else, probably a bunch of things were true. You were probably familiar to each other and maybe even related. You were visible to each other. You could see pain and pleasure on each other's faces, hear it in each other's voices. And you were accountable to each other. People knew each other's history of actions and could repay kindness and, I suppose, repay cruelty. Like, karma was like real and in the room. These pieces of social life, familiarity, visibility, and accountability, are what I would think of as empathy's primordial soup, right? Packed with ingredients that make it easy and natural for us to care for and connect with one another. But I would also argue that these same ingredients are increasingly disappearing from modern life which is nothing like it was back then in all sorts of ways. For one, people are more atomized than we used to be. 2007 was a wild year. You might not have heard about this, but it was the first time that more human beings lived inside cities than outside of them. This is a rapid trend. So in 1950, about one-third of humanity was urban. But by 2050, it'll be two-thirds. What that means is that your average run-of-the-mill human being just a few decades ago probably woke up in a place like this, a small town where everybody knew everybody. But now, and increasingly into the future, we wake up in places like this, massive cities where we're surrounded by millions of people. But remember that just being surrounded by people doesn't mean that we know anything about them. Because the rise in urban living has been accompanied by another dramatic rise in solitary living especially among young people. Americans between 18 and 34 are 10 times more likely to live alone than they were just one century ago. What this means is that in a real way, humanity is now alone in a crowd. We see more people than we ever have before, and we know fewer of them. And even the rituals that used to bring us into regular contact, like bowling leagues, or church going, or grocery shopping, have now been replaced with solitary pursuits which we often carry out online. Meaning that when we do interact, it's often in ways that are anonymous, thinned out, and transactional. This is not great soil for empathy, even if you like each other to begin with, but it gets even worse when we meet across difference. Because people are, of course, naturally also quite tribal. We split the world into us and them and tend to praise whoever we think is in us, and put scorn on whoever we think is a them. Tribalism is not new. It's as old as tribes. That's where it got its name. Um, and it characterizes all sorts of situations, everything from sports fandom to ethnic and international conflict. But for reasons we can talk about later, if you like, tribalism is ramping up um, over the decades, in fact, especially in political situations. This is terrible news for empathy because um, Tribalism doesn't just make empathy disappear, it in fact can reverse it, for instance, into schadenfreude, 
to people's enjoyment of other people's pain. I think of politics in the US and honestly beyond as sort of like a schadenfreude buffet. Right? You can like go on Twitter or read the news and find all sorts of people who seem less interested in advancing their own positions than they do in kind of trolling the other side, just producing suffering in people who they think are different from themselves and then like lapping up their tears in a sort of special ordered mug. Uh, <laughs> And then finally, in addition to being atomized and tribal, we are, of course, more than ever technologically mediated. We might not see our friends in real life, but we can interact with them all the time on massive social media platforms. I think of social media in particular and the internet in general as humanity's greatest empathic opportunity of all time. And if you read Wired from like 2010, this is what everyone was breathlessly talking about. This global community we were going to form where people could meet each other at any time, any place, anywhere on their own terms and respond with compassion. But I think many of us would agree that the internet has not lived up to that promise. Part of that is because life online often doesn't give us the cues that normally spark empathy. Right in this room we can see each other's faces and hear each other's voices, but online we're often reduced to anonymous avatars, or strings of text. Juliana Schroeder at Berkeley has done some really clever work demonstrating what this does to empathy. She had people read out loud their opinions about issues that mattered to them. And then she had a separate group of people and either played them the audio of that first person describing what they cared about, or wrote it down as a transcript and had those other people just read the transcript. What she found is that when people were deprived of a person's voice and could only read what they wrote, they were more likely to dehumanize that person, to see them as less than a full person, especially if they disagreed with them already. Other social media platforms encourage us to perform our least empathic selves. So William Brady and his colleagues have looked a lot at Twitter. They've scraped like hundreds of thousands of tweets. And what they find is that when people tweet in outrage, which is usually outrage at people who are different from themselves, they're rewarded with likes and retweets, especially from people who are already part of their group. Now what happens through this? Well, being rewarded with these little hits of social approval causes people to then express more outrage in subsequent tweets. It's almost like this ratchet effect where the sort of ecosystem, the token economy, of life online is pulling us further apart and encouraging us to not just be unempathic, but to be openly cruel towards people who are different from us. So to sum up, I guess empathy evolved for a world in which we were interdependent, aligned, and visible to each other. And now, more than ever, we're isolated, tribal, and anonymous. It's almost like if you were to design a system to break human empathy, you really couldn't do that much better than we have, right? And there's some evidence that empathy has broken. Here's the most common way psychologists measure empathy. It's just a questionnaire, a series of statements. And you're supposed to basically think about how well each statement describes you from one, not at all, to five, extremely. I'll give you a couple of these and you can try it yourself. You don't have to like yell out your answer. <laughs> Definitely don't yell out the answer you think the person next to you should get. That would be be awkward. Okay, let's try it. Um, here's the first one. I often have tender, concerned feelings for people less fortunate than me. You can think about how well that describes you. All right, here's another. I try to, we've got it, one five. <laughs> um, I try to look at everyone's side of a disagreement before I make a decision. So your answer to these two items plus 26 more would give you an empathy score between one and five. Does that make sense? Sort of like your average score. Um, this test was developed in the 1970s, and since then, hundreds of thousands of people have completed it. And recently, psychologists decided to put these data together, and the news was not great. Um, so here, I'll show you the average American score in 1979, a four out of five. Not bad, it's a solid B. No grade inflation on this test. <laughs> um, but here it is again in 2009, a three out of five. It's a big drop, to put it in perspective, the average American in 2009, by their own self-report, and we can talk about what that means later if you like, less empathic than 75% of Americans just 30 years before. 
So maybe this study is like shocking to you. Maybe it's the opposite of shocking to you. Maybe you didn't need a study to tell you that it's become harder for us to connect with one another. I kind of didn't, I mean, although this study is important, I feel like it's been a weird journey. For the last 15 years, I've been studying this phenomenon and like documenting the many ways that empathy helps people, like everybody involved, as a scientist. But as a person, I've noticed all of these cultural trends, like political polarization, or an epidemic of stress and anxiety among young people that seem to be pushing us in the opposite direction. Not together, but apart. I almost feel like, especially in the last four or five years, being a psychologist studying empathy feels like being a climate scientist studying the polar ice. It's like we, we demonstrate and discover the value of something just as it disappears all around us. Which is bleak. It's very bleak. Um, we're not done yet, though. I want to spend the rest of our time thinking about whether it has to be this way. Must we simply resign ourselves and accept that as we become more urban, more technologically mediated, which we will, that we must also become less connected, uh, angrier, even crueler? Or can we push back against these trends and try to reclaim our common humanity even in this modern context? I think the way that we answer that question depends on how we answer an even simpler question. Can we control our empathy at all? Now, on my read, my fields, psychology and neuroscience, have basically answered that question, no, you can't. Because empathy in these fields is commonly viewed as a trait, something that you just have or don't have, or you have at some level for your whole life. It's pretty fixed. I call this the Roddenberry hypothesis. And here I'm going to have to out myself as a huge dork. I mean, the reason I call it this is because Gene Roddenberry enshrined this idea of empathy as a trait into the characters of the greatest television show of all time, it's Star Trek The Next Generation. OK, all right. No fellow fans, that's OK. You know, I've been alone in this for a long time. Come to accept it. The show is being rebooted now, so maybe some of you will come along. But anyways, there are two characters. One, the ship's counselor, we're really doing this, the ship's counselor, Deanna Troy, known throughout the galaxy for her high levels of empathy. The other, Lieutenant Commander Data, an android, can't experience emotion and therefore is colorblind to the emotions of others. Now, crucially, neither of these characters has any say in the matter. Deanna Troy is a betazoid, so her preternatural empathy is like baked into her genes. And, uh, and Data, his lack of empathy is programmed, literally, literally hardwired into his positronic net, which is really what it's called. I'm a true fan, not kidding here. Uh, it is <laughs> so again, neither of these people, neither of these characters has any say in how empathic they are, and they're both stuck there, right? Data cannot become more empathic. Deanna Troy, even if she tries, cannot become less empathic. Now, the Roddenberry hypothesis, not just on the show, by the way, but in the field of psychology, is that if you draw a line between these two characters, that each one of us has some level of empathy, somewhere between them. And just like our adult height or the color of our eyes, we're basically frozen there for life. Now, if you're super empathic, this is great news for you. Because it means like, no matter what you do, you're going to benefit from empathy, and the people around you will too. But if you struggle with empathy, this is terrible news. Because it means that, again, no matter what you do or how hard you try, you'll never get better at connecting with people. It's even worse news for all of us together. Because it means that if the modern world is placing barriers in the way of empathy, we can't overcome those either. Right? This is a fatalistic view. Thankfully, it's also wrong. <laughs> I want to tell you about a new model of empathy that I and lots of other people in my field have been working on for a while. Um, for me, though, it actually turns out to not be that new at all. Um, it defined a lot of my childhood. Um, so it turns out that in the early 1970s, Washington State University offered full graduate scholarships to students from the world's poorest countries. And my mom uh, got the scholarship from Peru. My dad did not get a scholarship. He's not as good a student as my mom. Um, but he went to Washington State anyways. I don't know why. Um, from Pakistan. Uh, so they went from Lima and Lahore, these giant cities, to this sleepy town of Pullman, Washington, where they fell in love. Looking just extraordinarily 1970s. I mean, you just cannot make up that collar or those pants or, those gla or that hair or the mustache. It's really. Well, listen, I could roast my dad all day. Let's just get on with it. Anyway, so they, 
for them, it was not meant to be. Um, when I think about my parents now, you know, I think the thing that they had most in common is probably their sense of foreignness in the US. Right? They're both uncomfortable here, and they found solace in each other. Um, but I think as they grew acclimated to the US, they've been here for almost 50 years now, um, I think they realized how little they had in common, which, as their son, is very little, like extremely little that they have in common. Um, and uh, and so, so they um, began divorcing when I was eight and uh, didn't finish until I was 12. And it was not one of those amicable ones. It was the op whatever the opposite of amicable is. And I'm their only child. So I was sort of like the bridge between them. Uh, I think many children of divorce have experienced this, but I, too, shuttled back and forth between my parents' house for a bunch of my childhood. And it really felt like I was shuttling between parallel universes, because what my parents care about is so different. My mom is all about family, and my dad is extremely oriented towards achievement and ambition and intellect. He would always tell me, Austin, tell me, Jamil, where I come from, the kid who scores highest on, on an exam goes to college, and the kid who scores second highest ends up on the street. I don't know if it's really that stark, but he would tell me that over and over again. Anyways. When I was with my mom, I felt like I had to basically learn everything that governed her heart and mind. I had to figure out what mattered to her and make it matter for me. But then when I'd get to my dad's house, those same rules would stop working and I'd have to start all over again. And it was hard emotional labor for like an eight-year-old, right? Um, and I think those were difficult years. And for a while, I feel like all three of us thought that I would have to choose one of my parents and kind of give up on the other one. Um, but I knew that for the sake of all three of us, I had to keep trying. And so I did. Um, and eventually it got easier. And I learned to sort of tune myself to their different emotional frequencies. And you know, happy to say that I was able to maintain my bond with each of my parents, even as their connection to each other dissolved. Um, I would say that empathy saved me and saved my family, um, but not because it was easy. Right? I think of my parents' divorce as an empathy gym for me. It sort of forced me to work at care and understanding as a survival skill. And it was that work and the benefits that it brought to me and my family that made me interested in this in the first place. And since then, you know, I've discovered lots of evidence that contradicts standard wisdom, but actually connects with my own experience. In other words, empathy is not only a trait, it's, it's really something more like a skill. Our genes do matter. Let's be clear about that. But I would say that they dictate more our starting point, not necessarily where we end up. There's ample evidence that our experiences shape how and how much we empathize. Just like a muscle, some experiences might cause our empathy to atrophy, whereas others can cause our empathy to grow. Now, crucially, that means that if we make the right choices and cultivate the right habits, we can choose to grow our empathy on purpose. And we make these choices all the time. Will we cross the street to avoid a homeless person or pay attention to what they're going through? Will we tune out someone we disagree with or try to be curious about them? I think that when we make choices to connect over and over again, we can create empathic moments, empathic habits, and eventually become more empathic people. So if my parents' divorce was like an empathy gym for me, I guess I see my work now as building empathy gyms for other people places where they can go if they want to work out their ability to connect with others. Um, I just want to share briefly a few insights that my um, group and friends and I have gotten from this work. Uh, the first is that if you want to cross boundaries between us and them, you can begin by returning to you and I. One of the funny, not funny haha, -ha, but funny weird things about tribalism is that it saps our innate curiosity about other people. When we learn that someone has an opinion that we don't like or they're from a group that we don't like, we stop thinking of them as a full person. We just reduce them to one part of who they are. But that's really hard to do close up because people are enormously complicated. And no one can be boiled down to just one piece of their identity. So it turns out that decades of evidence now demonstrate that when people get to know the experiences of one individual from a group that differs from their own, they actually build empathy for that group as a whole. So recently, my colleagues and I tried a high-tech version um, of this to try to help uh, build empathy towards people who don't often receive it, homeless individuals in the Bay Area. So we created a simulation where people could go through the steps of what it might be, be to become homeless. 
I'll show you some of those scenes now. Um, in the first one, um, what is going on here? Okay, in the first one, um, uh, this person's in their apartment and has just been evicted. Um, in the second scene, they're living in their car, which is then impounded. And then in the third scene, they've taken to a local bus line for shelter. This is actually um, the 22 bus, which goes from Palo Alto to San Jose. This was, these scenes derived from interviews with homeless individuals. Um, this was a short simulation, but it had a long-lasting impact. So compared to, it was only 15 minutes, but compared to people in a controlled condition, folks who went through this VR simulation uh, a month later were less likely to dehumanize homeless individuals and more likely to sign a petition in favor of affording affordable housing policy in the Bay Area, which as you all know, it's like a big issue here. Um, thankfully though, you don't need like an Oculus Rift to connect with someone who's different from you um, reading novels or attending plays whose protagonists come from a group different from your own. It turns out to build empathy for real individuals in those groups. But maybe the best way to get to know someone who's different from you is to get to know someone who's, it's not that there's like, they're all around us. We just don't often cultivate friendships that are with people who are that different from us. Um, but it turns out that those friendships matter a lot. And in fact, one of those friendships probably saved Tony McAleer's life. So a few years after this picture was taken, Tony was trying to remove himself from life as a sort of white supremacist, but he was struggling with it. Um, and he befriended a guy named Dov Barron, who he didn't realize at the time was Jewish. And they were talking one day, and Dov brought up that he was Jewish, and Tony kind of said, oh, I guess I'll admit to my past. And so he admitted to his behavior as an anti-Semite. And he fully expected that Dov would punch him or cuss him out or leave the room, but he didn't. Dov instead extended Tony compassion. He said, uh, that's what you did. It's not who you are. You're better than that. I see you. Now let's be clear. Nobody owes empathy to somebody who would have their group destroyed. Right? We don't owe it to those people. But in Dov's choice to act empathically towards Tony in that moment, he fundamentally changed Tony's life. Right? Tony broke down. He spent the next hour crying with Dov. He was set on a path to reform. And in fact, not only did Tony extract himself from a life of hatred, he, uh, this is him more recently, he and his colleagues in 2011 formed the group Life After Hate, which is designed to recruit hate group members out of the organizations that they're in. They get hundreds of calls a week, and they teach hate group members that although hatred buries empathy, it doesn't kill it. And one of the best ways to get it back is to actually cultivate understanding of people who are different from ourselves. The second insight that I want to share with you all um, is that care is contagious. I mean, lots of behaviors are contagious because people are a massively conformist species. I mean, we do and think and feel and say what other people around us do. And that can be horrible when bad behaviors sort of propagate or spread through our social networks like viruses. But the good news is that positive behaviors are also contagious. And so my colleagues and I recently decided to try to leverage the power of conformity to build kinder cultures among the most conformist people on the planet, not a knock on them, but it's true, seventh graders, um, really, by age, the most conformist people on earth. Um, so we worked with four middle schools in the Bay Area, about 850 seventh graders, and we put them in a, a bunch of different conditions. I'm gonna tell you about one, which we call an empathic norms condition, where we tried to convince seventh graders that empathy is cool. <laughs> uh, we really did. Uh, here's a video that we showed them. Specifically, seventh graders tend to like empathy more, meaning that they want to be empathic. They also value empathy in others, meaning that they like it when other people are empathic and want to be friends with empathic people. Finally, they expect empathy from others, meaning that in seventh grade, most people are empathic. And now more than ever, you and your seventh grade peers are better able to share and understand each other's emotions. Okay, so we pointed people to this evidence that empathy was popular among their peers and would help them socially, which, by the way, is true. It turns out that seventh graders who are able to understand each other's emotions do better socially than those who struggle in the same regard. So we, tell, we give this to students and then we ask them to describe why they valued empathy. Okay, then when they left, we collated all their responses. Why? so that when they could, came back to school, we could give them a brochure of all their friends and classmates saying why they valued empathy. 
what are we doing here? We're exposing students to a real social norm all around them that they might have been oblivious to, the popularity of empathy among their peers. After that, we ask them to sort of stand for their grade and say what, how people in their grade feel about empathy. They were really excited to do this. Here's one sample response. People in my grade feel very strongly about empathy. In seventh grade, it's really important to value empathy. And I can see that many people in my grade value it a lot. Smiley face emoji, which I think is the most enthusiastic a seventh grader can get, um, at least that I've seen. Um, OK, so, so, um, so students here seem like when they hear about social norms around empathy, they're, they're more enthusiastic about it. Do they actually act more empathically? Well, we went back to these schools one to two months later. We asked students to nominate people in their class who were nice, who did favors for other people, who seemed caring. What we found is that people in our, students in our empathic norms condition, compared to students in two control conditions, were more likely to be motivated to empathize themselves, and that in turn predict their likelihood of acting kindly, not telling us that they acted kindly, mind you, but being nominated by others as having acted kindly, which we take to be a more convincing measure. So I think that this study has implications that go beyond the classroom, right? Sometimes in our culture, the loudest voices are not the kindest. Think about these seventh graders before our study. They might be pay paying attention to a bully in the schoolyard. They think about extreme pundits on cable news or your favorite loud, mean person on social media, whoever that might be, right? These people might not represent us, but they take up so much airspace that it's easy to confuse them for the majority and think that if we want to fit in, we have to fall in line. But it turns out that there might be more empathy than we know all around us. I mean, since writing this book, I've received hundreds of emails from people who say some version of, thank you for writing this. You know, I really want a more empathic culture, but I'm the only one. I'm like, can I put you all in a group chat or something? Like, there's a lot of you, right? And I think that one of the things that I, one of the messages from this work is to make empathy loud. And I say this to people, and they're like, I want to make it brag about my empathy. I don't want to say how many nice things. It's fine. You have to talk about your own empathy. Make other people's loud. Talk about the nice things and kind things that you've seen other people do. Because the more that we make empathy and kindness visible, the more that we make it magnetic through, again, the power of conformity. All right, the last thing that I'll say is that simply understanding that we can build empathy is the first step towards doing so. Many of you, I'm sure, know about my colleague Carol Dweck's foundational work on mindset. The idea that when people believe that they can grow, they work harder at challenging tasks. Uh, well, when I got to Stanford, Carol and I, along with our colleague Karina Schumann, decided to see whether the same was true of empathy. So in a series of studies, we convinced people that empathy was either a trait or a skill. We used these essays. So people read one of these two essays. One of them, empathy like plaster is pretty stable over time, meant to induce what we would call a fixed mindset around empathy. It's a trait, you can't change it. But other people read this one. Empathy is changeable and can be developed, encouraging people to view empathy as a learnable skill. After they read one of these two essays, we put these participants through an empathy obstacle course, or like full of situations where care and understanding don't always come naturally. And over and over again, we found that people we had just convinced that empathy was a skill worked harder at it. For instance, they spent more time listening to the struggles of someone who is a different race from themselves and said that they would invest more energy trying to understand the opinions of someone they disagreed with politically. This to me is encouraging, but also points to an irony, right? I've just told you that the dominant view of empathy in psychology is the Roddenberry hypothesis, the idea that empathy is a fixed trait. It turns out that not only is that wrong, it might be a toxic thing to believe because it might discourage people from working at empathy, even if doing so would help them. So hopefully by now you don't hold that erroneous opinion and you know that empathy is a skill and that you can use it however you see fit. You can point it or align it with your values. And that's what I want to challenge us to do. You know, let's end by returning to our ancient pal here, right? So this person maybe grew up in a social world that made empathy more natural. Fine, that's the difference between his world and ours. But his world was different from ours in like a million different ways. For one, it probably took him lots of energy and time just to find enough calories to survive. Now, evolving in an environment like that, human beings develop tastes for calorically dense foods like fat and sugar and salt. Those tastes don't always serve us well now, 
because we can live pretty sedentary lives and we're surrounded and inundated with calorically dense foods all the time. So we might just say, well, I guess our ancient instincts are poorly calibrated to the modern world and give up, but many of us don't. We try to do things like eat healthy or exercise, not because they come easily, they certainly don't to me, but because that's what we want to do and that's who we want to be. I'd encourage us to think about empathy the same way and I want to challenge us to empathize with purpose, especially when it's hard. To point our care at people without a voice and point our curiosity at people who might upset us or who we might find hard to understand, even if tuning them out would be easier. I think if you can do that, then you can benefit from empathy's positive qualities and the people around you can as well. But if a critical mass of us can do that together, then maybe something bigger can happen. Maybe we can start to push back against these trends, reclaim our common humanity, and mend some of the tears in our social fabric. And that, I think, is the good news here. Empathy is not just a precious resource, it's also a renewable one. Thank you. You mentioned the uh, Roddenberry hypothesis, and I think what you said was that the large number of your colleagues still accept that as the reasonable description. And so it sounds like you have a momentous job in front of you just adjusting the colleagues. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, there's the Roddenberry hypothesis, and thank you for calling it that. I, if, the more that I can get Star Trek worked into my field, the, that's really my titanic effort that I'm going through. The empathy thing is just a Trojan horse. Um, but, but no, I mean, I think that the Roddenberry hypothesis is just one version of a view of human nature more broadly, right? I mean, there's a lot about us that we used to think was fixed. Neuroscientists used to believe that you know, after, after we end childhood, our brains are basically fixed. We used to think that our intelligence was fixed, that our personalities were fixed, and that our empathy was fixed. So I think there's sort of a broad shift in our field's consciousness towards the effects of experience on a lot of different aspects of human nature. Um, and I think that that view is gaining some momentum. Now let's again, let me be clear that Empathy and, all, and intelligence and all these other parts of us have strong genetic components, right? So I think saying that something is a skill is not the same as saying that there's, that, that there's no genetic component at all. But I think now this sort of recognition of our psychological mobility, if you will, is balancing the scale. Please. Curious why you called the book The War for Kindness. It seems not a logical term. It's like the war against drugs and all these things mm -hmm. that almost set people up for a more violent approach. Yeah. Um, it's, thank you. It's a, it's a question that I've gotten a lot and that I asked myself at one point. This book was not always called The War for Kindness. It used to be called Choosing Empathy. Um, and, you know, I guess... A bunch of things happened in the world that just made, uh, made me feel as though empathy is, sounds fuzzy, but it's not always. It's, it's hard. Um, and I think that there are spaces in our culture where empathy is actually pretty discouraged and that we have to fight uphill to express it, where empathy actually feels more like a rebellious or radical act that is contra something else, that's contra to a culture of indifference or cruelty. So I do think that we can fight for kindness, um, and I, I think we must, actually. Oh, I feel like I'm oversampling from this side of the room, yeah. Hi. Um, you talked a little, about, a, a little bit about it, but I want to hear from you about our um, political context within the whole world. Um, what do you think, uh, besides the, the lack of human uh, connection, what other aspects do you think that are making it so hard and like so spread around? You mean in political context, why is empathy yeah, this so... Hatred yeah, hatred within... Yeah. Like, oh. um, well, I mean, I think that, so we're more polarized ideologically than we were before, but there's also something um, that people in the communications and political science departments here have studied called affective polarization, which is the way that people feel about folks on the other side, and that is way worse than it was even a few decades ago, right? So if you ask people in the 1960s, you know, how would you feel if your child were to marry someone of the opposite political party? You know, in 1960, I think 3% of people would say that they were upset 
and in 2011 or 2010, it was like 30 or 40 percent of people, right? So it, politics has become a lot more personal. I think part of that is by design. Um, you know, our media. Land, I'm going to try to not go too long on this. You know, like cable news is only 30 years old, and their, their entire business model is, well, we're not going to have as large an audience as network news, so we have to have a very loyal audience. And so the way that to get a loyal audience is to um, Let's call it pandering, right? To, to say what people want to hear over and over again. I also think that, um, you know, for maybe for the same reasons or stemming from that, people have a strong zero sum perception of political outcomes. And, and I think people are really scared that if the other side um, sort of prevails, that, that, that they will be, they, their side will be destroyed or that something really existential will occur. Um, so there's lots of evidence that in those cases, that people basically feel that empathy with the other side is not only a betrayal of their own side, but it is like giving up. That if you empathize with someone who, who disagrees with you, you're losing the fight in some way. You're, con you're ceding ground to them in a way that will um, cause them to prevail. It turns out there's at least some evidence that the opposite is true, that when you empathize with someone on the other side, you're more likely to be persuasive towards them. This is what's known as deep canvassing. Um, but, but you know, I don't think that people get that uh, necessarily. Manaz, we can talk offline. Do you mind if I, yeah, I just want to, <laughs> Manaz is one of my colleagues, but, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll chat, we'll chat in the lab, yeah. Please, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Y yeah, I don't know, I think you probably do need to, I, yeah. I mean, I can hear you. I thought you, uh, so my question, in your research, I'm curious if you've been informed by nonviolent communication and Marshall Rosenberg, and if so, how? Yeah, so I, I can't say that, 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 that my research has drawn that much from nonviolent communication, but I think that sort of it's actually pertinent to the previous question, you know, the sort of approach to engaging with people in that way is hugely useful from an applied perspective, and I think that it's, that movement is, like, in me, is totally aligned with the type of um, with the type of ideas that are in the book, yeah. Yeah, please. Do you see this problem of em empathy decline worldwide, or is it mostly our society? Uh, it's a great question that we don't have an answer to. So the the cross temporal, so the, the, that work is what's known as a cross temporal meta analysis, where you just like look at data from over time. It's not longitudinal, by the way. So we don't know that the same people are becoming less empathic over time. We also don't know, which is the inference that some people draw, that like kids these days are less empathic than older generations. We don't know either of those things from that work. But we do know that in the US, empathy has been on the decline. There's also cross-cultural work looking at that same questionnaire in like many different countries. But there's not a combination of the two. So we don't know the tra trajectory over time in other cultures. So yeah, I mean, I can speculate, but there's no empirical answer to your question. But it's a really good one. Um, you, at the end, you closed by saying empathy is a renewable resource. And I'm curious if you think there's like any diminishingness to that. And kind of related to that, why often empathy is like um, discussed um, with reaching across the aisle to like a white nationalist, as, oppo as opposed to like our more downtrodden communities the homeless, indigenous, black, brown communities, and why we don't like start with empathy from some of those um, anecdotes. Yeah, um, so that's a structural and political question, really, which I'm happy to talk about. I mean, um, absolutely, I, I feel like, um, you know, I, I don't want to editorialize too much, but, you know, I remember after the election of uh, our current president, there were all these op-eds in the news. It felt like every single person who voted for Donald Trump got their own op-ed or their own profile in the New York Times. I even remember there was a profile of this like Nazi couple from Illinois um, that was really meant to like humanize them and they talked about the type of pasta that they cooked. And I remember being like, I'm sorry man, I don't want to read about the Nazi pasta, you know? Illinois Nazis, that's like the Blues Brothers talked about them. It's just not necessary. Like it did feel as though the, um, the, the ask to empathize was going in one direction and not the other. Now, uh, that is not to say that empathy in that direction is useless, um, but I think that it should be balanced. And in fact, my friend and a great scientist in this, in this space, Emile Bruneau, has examined that. So 
Um, some of you might have heard of this something called contact theory, where you bring people together and sort of like, you know, um, sort of like a tabletop conversations or you know summer camps for kids from Palestine and Israel or whatever, and those are meant to generate regard across these group divisions. And what Emil found is that oftentimes that works for the people in the traditionally higher powered group. They're like, oh, this is great. I learned about somebody who has less power than, than I do. It was really, it was, I learned so much and it was eye-opening and I feel like my horizons have been expanded. People from traditionally lower power or lower resource groups sometimes don't feel that way. They think, wait a minute, my entire life is filtered through the lens of that perspective, that dominant, let's call it, I don't know, white, male, wealthy perspective. So to like have to sit there and listen to more about this person's struggles is not actually that edifying for me at all. And so what Emil did was he showed that if you actually reverse power structures and give people who are from traditionally less powered groups a chance to do what's not called perspective taking, but perspective giving to tell their stories, and you give people from traditionally higher powered groups the chance to really be the listening end of that conversation, that actually increases regard uh, across both parties. So I think that, that it's, a, it's a great question that you know, I can't answer why that is, like why we do that, except that people in power <laughs> tend to try to keep it. And, uh, but, you know, but, um, but I think that psychology, or research from psychology, suggests that there are ways to reverse that and, and that those um, can bring people together. It's a long answer to a relatively short question, but hope it was helpful. Hey, over here. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. You mentioned the negative impact of social media on this problem. So if you were to advise Facebook on what they could do to change things, what would it be? Uh, you know, besides nationalizing themselves <laughs> or disbanding? Uh, no, I mean, I think that... Um, Right, so I have advised social media platforms before, and I think that one of the things that we need to look at is the type of, um, the type of incentive structures that they have, the things that people are rewarded for, the ways that they process those rewards, and also the types of engagement and communication that those platforms lend themselves to. Right? So for instance, on Twitter, right, I think it's really problematic that basically whatever is most eye-catching or provocative is shared the most, and that then reinforces people for saying provocative and often quite unkind things. There's another site, much smaller, called Change of View. It used to be a, a, what's known as a subreddit, sort of like a message board on this like, giant message board called Reddit, where, but now it's its own website, where people post opinions that they have that they understand are controversial, but that they're willing to think about more. And they're, they're forced to write at least a couple paragraphs. And then people uh, have to engage with them, right? They, the people respond, and they have to write at least a couple of paragraphs. And, um, and people are rewarded instead of sort of getting retweeted. You receive something called a delta, where people sort of like reward you if what you said has shown them this, you know, has changed their mind in some way. And if you look at that site, I mean, the type of engagement is just fundamentally different than what you see on Twitter. And I think it's because of the rewards that we're giving people. I mean, the thing is, people go to social media because they want to connect with others. It's an ancient, really you know, wonderful, sort of touching need that we have to be part of something greater than ourselves. But social media, as it stands, has sort of perverted that into, um, I guess, the uh, capitalizing on vanity and fear and um, all of that. So we could, but, but, but that's a choice that those platforms made that they can unmake or that new platforms can remake. Your white supremacist story was so incredibly touching to me. Was it Tony? Tony, yeah. Yeah. Um, from his childhood to his involvement to the Jewish person who befriended him in such a kind way and, and to what he did afterwards. It was yeah. just amazing. So I'm just feeling I want to know a lot more about it. Is that something that you cover in your War for Kindness book? I do, yeah. Um, there's a whole chapter on Tony, but you really want to learn about Tony, you should read not my book, but his, which came out just a few months ago. It's called The Cure for Hatred. It's terrific. I mean, it's, he's, he's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. So, I, I, this was a great talk. Um, I just had a question about, so in a lot of the online communities I've seen where people are responding, like watchdog groups and things like that, where people are responding to a group that they're not very happy with, like, they often start from a place of anger. 
And then instead of going directly to a place of empathy, sometimes they can instead go to this place of pity where it's like, mm. oh, this sucks that these people were like raised in a way where they learn these things and I feel so sorry for them, but that's just how they are. And I guess like how, like is, is I guess is it, how do you, how do you make the prog like is that typical to go through that stage is it like a halfway mark or is it like is there a way to get I, yeah I, I can't really speak to the to the like stages or the dynamics of how we go through these but i will say that pity is a state that often is confused with empathy but is really quite different from it right i mean when you pity somebody you're in a way reducing them sort of the same way that you would if you didn't like them, right? I mean, you're basically defining them by some particular struggle that they're going through, and you're usually making them a static character, right? You're deciding that they, that's like you said, they were just raised that way and that's just who they are, right? You're sort of fixing them there. I think real empathy is the recognition of common humanity with another person and the ability to say, well, if I can change, then they can change. And if they've been through struggles, then I've been through struggles. But they have hope and potential just, like, just as much as I do, right? So I think that I don't know how we get from one to the other, but I know that we should not confuse them with each other. OK, great. Thank you very much. <laughs>